My name is Madrona. I am a retired midwife. I've practiced for almost 40 years. Um, I worked at the birth center here before it closed, and I also worked at the home birth practice, um, one of the home birth practices here. I teach at UNM. I teach various subjects, including some midwifery-related things and energy work. I'm a cranial sacral therapist. My specialty is newborns and mamas. Um, I love to see women when they're pregnant and kind of establish a relationship. Ahead of time, I can make pregnancy a little bit easier and um, all those aches and pains, especially toward the end of pregnancy. Um, and I also do something called placenta encapsulation, which is when we turn your placenta into medicine. And I'm a Reiki therapist, so I kind of have my fingers in lots of pies. <laughs> and I'm, I teach for First Steps, so I teach the childbirth class for them, which is twice a year. And I feel really honored to be a part of this group. Jana brought me in, and we started talking about doing postpartum. So that's a little, a little about me. So, so we're going to talk about an immediate postpartum. So in immediate postpartum, ideally, your baby's going to be brought right from being born and put onto your body. And that's what, we, that's what we really hope for, is that you can bring your body up, your baby up, and bring it up to your heart. Um, and, and babies are very, you know, they've been in a womb, and they've been in this sort of quiet, tucked-in place for the last nine months. And so when they come out, their ears are really sensitive, and they're sensitive to smells. Their skin has never been physically touched. So we want to be really gentle with babies when they come out. Now, the womb is actually pretty loud, you know, so, and, and they hear the noises that are out, and if somebody talks down around the lower, the baby will hear it. I mean, it's a pretty loud place. But they've been listening through water. So, you know, sometimes when babies are born, everybody wants to scream, and they, the baby's here, and be, you know, maybe loud. And so try. <laughs> and, it's, and usually moms aren't so much in that place. It's everybody else that's in that sort of in that place. So if you can just sort of remind them to bring their voices down a little bit and have that have that quiet space for you to get to know your baby. If you can keep your baby skin to skin, that is the best. And they tend to want to like wrap baby up. And I'm going to encourage you to ask them to let you unwrap the baby so that you get to look at baby and also get baby onto your skin. And then you can put warm blankets over the two of you. That way you guys could stay warm and the baby stays warm. Babies don't regulate their temperature until they're a couple of days old and even then they still have a little bit of a hard time so we want to keep them warm and the best place your body is going to be like a hot place so here's something really interesting your skin and sweat smells the same as the amniotic fluid and so does the colostrum so baby knows that taste and that smell from being inside the womb. So when baby comes out and you put baby on top of you, they recognize the smell, they recognize how you taste, and of course they recognize your voice because they've been listening to you inside them the whole time. So you really want to you know, get to know them and hang out. Um, we like to see babies get on the breast within the first hour. That doesn't always happen as soon as you can. Um, even if you can't get baby to nurse right away, having baby at the breast, nuzzling, um, letting them, the word we use is root, let them root around. And uh, a fun thing, if you guys want to watch something, if you go into YouTube, you can type in the breast crawl. It's a really wonderful video that shows babies literally crawling up the body, and they kind of bob their head and go toward the breast, and it's, it's really sweet. So, you know, I encourage you, if you can watch that, to, to do that. So, you know, bring baby to the breast and let them nuzzle and get close. It can be a little bit of a shock. Some women, when their babies first come, they're so excited and they bond right away. And some women kind of shut down a little bit. In one of my favorite birth videos, it's a birth film from Brazil back from the 70s. Um, you see all these mamas kind of bring their babies up, smiling, talking, but there's this one mama that like, the baby comes, she's in a squatting position, she looks down at the baby, she turns her head away and just sort of hangs there for a minute and then comes back and sort of checks the baby out. So it's not, bonding is not always instantaneous. And I think 
for women who think I'm supposed to immediately fall in love with my baby, and if you don't, you feel like there's something wrong with you, and it's not. You're not. And one of the things that you should know about bonding is it's an ongoing. So the first time that you get the baby on the breast, it, there's a bonding moment. The first time the baby smiles at you, it's a bonding moment. The first time they say mama, it's a bonding moment. I mean, it continues on and on. My kids are in their 30s, and when they share some big new life experience with them, I fall head over heels in love with them all over again, even though that they're you know grown up. So, you know, so don't beat yourself up if you don't have that instantaneous, I'm in love with my baby. You're getting to know them, they're getting to know you. Be really patient with that process. And what you should expect in the first 24 hours is lots of bleeding. You're going to do your most bleeding in the first 24. And, um, and you're going to pee like a racehorse. Because your s tissues have been holding lots and lots of fluid. And then, you know, and some of it's in your amniotic sac, but a lot of it is in your actual tissues. And so you'll find in the first 24 hours that you're voiding, voiding, voiding because your body is getting rid of that extra fluid. And, you, and that's really a good thing. Um, you'll actually feel better when you start, start that process of peeing a lot. Um, you may be really wired and have a hard time sleeping. Even if you can't sleep, you want to rest. You may be um, exhausted and that's all you want to do is sleep, so sort of follow what your body tells you. You might find that um, you're starving, ravenous, or that you have no appetite. The point is we're dealing with the human body and everything is always, you know, we're all different. So there's not, no exact rule about this. And since you'll be at Holy Cross, you'll have help and support with all those things. The nurses are pretty well trained with breastfeeding. I'm sure you've been on them <laughs> about that. Um, and so that'll be some of your initial touchstones. Um, you know, is helping with breastfeeding. I, I know Aaron's had babies before, so this will, some ways, will be old hat, but every baby is new and different, so it's always a learning experience. Um, your immediate body changes. Um, I don't know how many of you have this sort of fantasy that you're going to have a baby and you're going to go back to your prenatal body. But that's a, and, and especially when you see these Hollywood stars that are like, look at me, I'm six weeks postpartum and I'm, you know, not realistic. Bring clothes that were around six to seven months, you know, in, in your pregnancy because you'll still have a belly for a while. It takes a while and you're going to nurse that off. You're going to start to slowly move that out of your body. Remember that you took nine months to get to that size, and it's gonna take time to reverse that. So there are women who drop weight, and I actually worry about women who do that. But there are some women, that's their metabolism, and they just drop weight really quick. And you see them at two weeks postpartum, and they look like they never were pregnant. But most of us, it takes a while for that to go away. And just be patient with that. And yeah, wear loose, bring loose, comfy clothes that you can, you know, maybe have a drawstring and to wear home. Because if you bring something that's going to be too tight, you're going to be miserable. And if they're falling off of you, that's going to be miserable. So kind of bring something that's easy to, to wear home. Your breasts will feel about the same in the first 24 hours. You know, maybe a little bit of some sensation. Your nipples might feel some sensations from nursing, but you won't really feel like your milk is coming in or anything yet. That takes a little while for that to happen. Um, and, and if possible with Holy Cross, if there's not a problem, they're going to send you home within 24 hours of the baby being born. Okay, so go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so the first week, first week is, okay, so I have this sort of state, statement that I make to moms. There's a whole thing about 40 days, and we're going to talk more about that in a minute, but um, two weeks in bed, two weeks on the bed, two weeks next to the bed. Okay, that's not literal. But those first, that first week, you want to be down as much as possible. So being in bed can mean being on the couch with your feet up. It doesn't have to be physically in bed. But you want to be down as much as you can. You want to sleep when baby sleeps. You want to eat when you're hungry. You want to just, if you're moving around, you want to be really slow with that, allowing your body to recover. Your uterus has just gone from being way out here to internally being 
about, so you know how they measure you? So when you're at term, you're measured somewhere between 36 and 40, 40 centimeters. And your uterus goes from being up here to being right below your navel when you go home. So it, it's, in, but there's the ligaments that are in there, especially the round ligaments are really stretched out. And so if you get too active too quickly, it can increase your bleeding, it can reduce your milk supply because you're exhausted. So you really wanna take that first week and just be down as much as possible. Keep your visitors to a minimum, especially right now with COVID. Uh, and I always have a rule, if someone's coming in, they're coming in with a purpose. They're gonna come in and do a load of laundry, they're gonna come in and bring a meal. They're gonna take the baby so you can take a shower. You know, there's really big purpose behind it. It's not to sit and hang out with you and keep you awake. Again, that can affect your, if you're still learning to breastfeed and somebody comes in and you're not particularly comfortable and baby gets cranky, that can affect your nursing relationship because you're pushing you know, aside, you're waiting for them to leave. So be real clear with your friends and family that they come for, you know, 20 minutes, that when you, it was time for you to nurse the baby, it's time for them to leave. Tell them it's not personal. You know, this is about you taking care of yourself and establishing a good relationship. If you're healing from a vaginal birth, you'll have, again, that bleeding. Um, it'll restart to reduce a lot. You may have a really sore bottom. If you've torn or had an episiotomy, you'll have stitches that will need to heal. Um, again, your uterus is, is healing and it's very, those ligaments are really stretchy. You may have cramps, especially someone who's had a baby before. So first time mamas sometimes don't really feel them. We all have them, it's just not everybody feels them. But women who have had a child um, usually feel those after birth contractions a little stronger. Um, so you'll, you know, just giving yourself that time to heal because you've just done a marathon. You've just, and rather you have a two hour labor or two day labor, your body has worked really hard. So be really gentle with yourself. If you've had a cesarean, you won't come home to, for two to three days. Um, it matters on how busy they are at Holy Cross. They're really good at keeping people longer there. And after, after a C-section, um, they'll give you really great directions. But one of the things that I really wanna say about C-sections is that it takes six weeks for your uterus to go back to normal with, with a vaginal birth. It takes six weeks for the ligaments to go back to normal. It takes three months to heal from a C-section. So you really want to give yourself time. So that first week is really essential. So you're being home, your feet are being up, you're letting people wait on you. Hand, you know, the only time you should be getting up is if you need to use the bathroom, um, and you know, giving yourself a walk, you know, a few a few minutes walk a few times a day because you don't want to develop blood clots and that kind of thing. But you don't want to be running around or cleaning your house, doing, you know, I always say in postpartum, if I walk into a house and it's just the mom and dad in the house, and I walk in and the house is clean, it's a red flag for me. <laughs> you know, when I come in and they go, I'm so sorry, the house is really dirty. I'm like, no, this is really good. It means you're not doing too much. <laughs> Unless they happen to have a partner that's really on top of stuff, but it's not usually, that's not usually true. If you have an in-law there, like your mom or your mother-in-law that's cleaning the house, that could be a whole different thing. But you really wanna, um, stay low key as possible. And, and I just want to use this example. I had a mom who was in my chopper class and then I did cranial work on her and her baby. And she had her mother-in-law there for a really, she initially had her mom and then her mom left and then she had her mother-in-law there for a very long time. And it became really challenging. It became, and so, um, you know, I just want to say that, you know, setting really good healthy boundaries and the family dynamic can be really challenging. If you can set them while you're pregnant, that's even better than setting them when you're in postpartum, when you're vulnerable and your emotions are pretty high. Um, and letting them know that you need private time and you do, don't need your mother or your mother-in-law to tell you how to take care of your baby. You know how to do that. And even if you think you don't know how to do it, you really do. That's really intuitive for us to know how to take care of our baby. And maybe the way you want to take care of your baby is really different than they took care of their baby. So, you know, establishing, having that conversation 
before the emotions are running high is a really smart thing to do and to say, you know, I want to draw some boundaries. She ended up having to have her husband kick her mother, her mother-in-law out. I mean, it was pretty, it was pretty dramatic, you know, and, um, and I hate to see those family dynamics get like that. So if you can establish those good relationships ahead of time, that's, you know, that's really good. Know that you're going to be sleep deprived. And what can come with that is the inability to sleep. Okay, and that may sound funny, but what can happen is it can build on each other. And if any of you have had a rough had it in day where you had insomnia, you go to bed the next day exhausted, thinking, oh now I'll really sleep, and you don't. You know, so you're gonna go into postpartum with some sleep de deprivation. It happens during pregnancy where you have a harder time sleeping. Then you've had labor. And then you're in postpartum, and when you're in that initial postpartum, the nurses are coming in every couple hours to check on you, and then you go home, and you gotta figure out how to nurse every two hours, how to eat for yourself, and how to sleep. So find comfort measures that will help you sleep. There's Nervines, there's herbs that you can drink, you know, like, like um, Sleepy Time Tea or, you know, ones like that. You can, um, if you haven't had a C-section, you can take, uh, you know, a bath, or you can take a warm shower. You can go on a small walk around the house, maybe just in your neighborhood, just to sort of move the energy, but not too much. Um, you know, get, pull out a book. I know, what are those? Nobody reads books anymore. Put it, pull out a, a physical book. There's something about reading when you're trying to go to sleep that makes your eyes get heavy and fall asleep. And if you can't sleep, rest. Lay down, turn on relaxing music, close your eyes. Sometimes when you think you won't be able to sleep, you'll actually be able to, you know, for a little while. And be prepared that you're going to be up every two hours. So again, the rule is sleep when baby sleeps in the beginning because you're not going to get a long stretch. Now, some babies will do one four-hour stretch a day. They're really gifts, and occasionally they even happen at night. Most of the time they don't. Most of the time they happen during the day. <laughs> so if you see a pattern developing with your baby where your baby takes a four-hour nap or a three-hour nap, that's going to be the time not to clean your house and do laundry. That's going to be the time to go to bed and sleep with them so that you really get that ability to, to get that, that rest. But expect it, and don't be surprised by sleep deprivation because it's really a part of postpartum. Um, and you're learning to nurse. So I just really want to make this really strong statement that those of you who have not had children, you've never nursed a baby. But this baby has never breastfed. So you're learning. Be patient with yourself. Know that there are going to be times when babies refuse the breast, where they pull away, where they scream and cry, and you think, oh, the baby doesn't like my milk. It's not true. You know, they're just having a rough moment. Sometimes dads or, or, or the family member that's there can walk around with baby, big, big, you know, older siblings. Um, you know, pat baby on the back and calm them down. But just know that breastfeeding is a learned experience. And it's one of our mis really misnomers out there. We all think this is the most natural thing in the world. I should just be able to bring baby, put it at the breast, baby will latch on, everything will be fine and dandy. It really doesn't work that way for a lot of babies. Now there are some babies that latch right on, they seem to, they seem to hone in, they seem to know what they're doing, and it works out really well. But if they don't, then ask for help. And we have, we have Jana here. <laughs> Because it's a learned experience. And I say this over and over again, it takes six weeks to establish a good milk supply. And it takes six weeks to establish a good nursing relationship. It also takes six weeks for the uterus to get back to where it was. And in every culture in the world, they put mamas to bed for 40 days. Guess how long 40 days is? Six weeks. It's like shy by two days. So if you can take six weeks to like cool your life out, that's really good for you and the baby and expect that you're gonna be learning and by the end of that six weeks, you should have a good nursing relationship established, your body should feel good, you should have lost some weight, you know, your self-confidence is built up. I mean, really give yourself that, that time to do that. Day 
two to day four, your milk will come in. There's a big range, most common is day three. Sometimes it's a little bit um, later with C-section moms. Um, that is the day that everybody, everything will make you cry. You watch a commercial on TV, you know, and it's about, oh, your, your, you know, a birthday card or something along that, and you find yourself weeping. <laughs> <laughs> um, my daughter-in-law, when she had her first baby, um, she had music on, and I didn't make the connection right away. It was day three. And uh, um, the song Hallelujah by um, Leonard Cohen came on, and all of a sudden she was like, oh, you know, big tears. And I was like, oh, my God, what's wrong? And then I listened to I said, oh, this, you, we're shutting this song off. <laughs> So you just, I believe I'm doing it, you know. So know that that's really normal, and part of that is hormones. Part of that is because you're starting to finally take all this in. Some of this is because your milk is coming in and your breasts feel really different, and you're still figuring all this stuff out. And part of it is because you've just gone through this major transition in your life. So again, be gentle with yourself. And if you need to hand the baby to dad and go in the bathroom and have a big cry, it's okay to do that. In fact, you'll feel so much better if you do that and let yourself kind of be there. Um, so your hormones are going to, your pregnancy hormones and birth hormones are going to go down. And this is going to happen much in the first 24 hours. And then your nursing hormones are going to come up. So this is a time of lots of fluctuation. And, you'll, and you, you, may, you may feel kind of a little crazy in moments. Just know this is normal and it will pass. And just stay, stay patient with that. This is not the time to go on a junk food fat, you know. And it's really easy to do that because, you know, your husband goes and runs to Wendy's and brings home food because it's easy because you're cleaning the house. If you have friends that offer to bring you meals, say yes. And if you don't, make stuff up ahead of time and throw it in the freezer. Make a little lasagna or a pot of soup. You know, soup is great, especially this time of year. But soup is great for postpartum because it's easy to heat, it's easy to digest, and it will last for four or five days. You know, and even if you may be sick of chicken vegetable soup by the end of that time, it's very nourishing. So this is the time to drink lots of water, to eat really good food, and, um, and to eat to where you're comfortable. So keep your sugar levels down, keep your junk food levels down, you know. It's not that you can't have a, an occasional indulgence, but be careful and keep your nutrition up. And we have someone that's gonna talk about nutrition in January, right? Yeah, so that's, I'm, I'm not gonna go deeply into it, so that's pretty much it, go ahead. Okay, so what are you feeling? I actually stole this from one of my postpartum doula friends in Portland. <laughs> she put this on her Facebook page, and I was like, oh, this will be perfect for the class. <laughs> so some of the emotions that you may be feeling, starving all the time, exposed and raw, um, overwhelmed, um, touched out. I, I remember many, many years ago, and I really wish I had a copy of this. It was a breastfeeding film by this woman named Kitty Franz. And Kitty would talk about how there were times when you wanted to just go and have a, like a, a capsule come up around you where nobody could touch you, nobody could talk to you, that you were just in your little bubble, you know. And I think showers are a great place for when you feel like that because you can say, here's baby, I'm going to go take a shower, leave me alone, right? Um, that's not always easy. That doesn't always happen, but it's you can ask for it. So if you're touched out and your partner wants to connect up, you can say, I feel really touched out and I just need some time. You know, if you say it versus just reacting, then it'll cause less stress between the two of you. You may feel really, really tired. You may feel over responsible. These are all normal emotions in postpartum. And and know that you're going to have good days and challenging days and great days where you feel on top of the world and days when you think, what did I do to myself? Those are all really normal feelings. And, and again, it gets easier with time. Um, and then you can say, what, you know, to the people in your family, you know, you can ask them to support you. You can ask them to go shopping for you. You can ask them to... Um, 
do a load of laundry. You can ask them to take the baby while you go take a shower or take a walk. You can ask for the help that you need. That doesn't always mean we get it, but the only way we know is if we ask for it. And again, the more you can set up before you have a baby, the better. That, that will serve you really, really well. Okay, so ways to receive support. So, you know, everybody wants to do the big baby shower and blankets and toys and, you know, and there's sometimes things that you either are never going to use, they're not your style. I, I remember when I had my second child and everybody wanted to give me all these toys and I was a wooden toy fanatic with my kids and everything that they gave me was all plastic and I was like, sending it back, you know, because it wasn't what I wanted. So one of the ways, if I hadn't thought about it, I would have said to people, please don't spend money on things that I don't need. But what I do need is, so you can ask for a postpartum doula, you can ask for, you know, diapers, you can ask for meals is a really big one, you know, so you don't have to worry about cooking. Um, help at home, these are all things that you can do, you know, with them versus, and we all love gifts, they're fun, but how many receiving blankets do you really need? And if you've had a baby before, you're gonna reuse a lot of that stuff. So I know some of you are on your first baby and you have a big span between yours. I have 11 years between my first and my second, so I understand. <laughs> you, start, you start all over again. But you know, it's like, so either find yourself the ability, ask for a gift, you know, they do these gift receipts that you can go back to, Target or Walmart or wherever and return them and put them toward what you want or um, you know or be really clear with your friends and family about what you need when I was pregnant with my second child I really wanted a really good stroller and I was very clear about that and I was like you want to get me something put money into this pool so I can get this really fancy stroller with the big wheels because I wanted to be able to know you know so it, it it can make a really big difference and then you get this card and all your friends have signed it and said oh you know and every time you use that stroller you're like oh I'm so glad I got what I wanted <laughs> instead of a bunch of toys that I'm never going to use so <laughs> and getting a postpartum doula or a housekeeper because you know that you know having somebody come in once a week again with COVID protocols making sure that they're safe and all those to come in and clean your house so that you feel like you're not, because that way you get to focus on baby and yourself versus on your house. Because the house will fall apart if you don't find a way to get that taken care of. All right, so postpartum, it's six weeks, or also called the fourth trimester. And I, I really believe in the nine months in and the nine months out, the babies are born, they're like marsupials. You know, almost every animal in the, in the animal world, cows, sheep, goats, they get up on all fours within minutes of birth. And they have to be functional out in the world, especially the, the, the wilder the animals, you know, we all know this from deer, you know, elk, all those, all those animals are just smaller versions, but they need to be able to get up and move. You know, mama elephant has a baby, and she's got to be able to move with the herd within moments of having that baby, and that little baby has to move along with the herd. But koala bears and panda bears and human babies don't. And they get to be cuddled and connected and held. So if you can think of this as, in about nine months is when they start to get really proactive. You see a change in babies around nine months old. It's somewhere between nine and 10. And um, it's not an unusual time if women have gone back to work for babies to self-wean. You know, if you go away for a weekend at nine months, you may have a hard time nursing when you come back. I learned that one the hard way. It's not the time to do it. Either do it before, way earlier, or way later. <laughs> Um, you know, but they start to get really independent and they start to pull slightly away from you. They're still connected, but they start to have that independence. Up until that point, they really are, you know, pack, little pack critters. You know, they want to be in a 
close to your body. They want to nurse a lot. They want to, you know, if you walk out the room, they're like, where are you? You know, they really want to be connected. So be in that place where you expect that it's going to be nine months when they're out in the world, that it's, you know, just that they need that full 18 months to really come to that place where they're more independent. And they're still very dependent on you because most kids don't walk till they're about a year old and they wouldn't be able to go out and you know, cook for themselves or do any of those things. But there is an independence that kicks in around that time. When you go back to work, that's different for everybody. If you can take three months off, that is the best, at least three months, at least six weeks. I've actually known women who were in jobs that were demanded to go back to work when their babies were a month old. And again, you're not even done in that, you're not out of that fourth trimester at four weeks. So try to negotiate with, you know, and again, this is not realistic for everybody. So you do your best, but the longer you can stay home and stay with your baby, preparing for that ahead of time. If you're planning on full-time breastfeeding, learning how to pump your milk, develop a, a milk supply. There's all kinds of information out there about how to do that, when to introduce a bottle. I'm Jenna is happy to help with that whole process. I always say you don't really want to introduce a bottle until nursing is well established, till their suck reflex is really working well. Um, for some babies that's immediate, for some babies it's at six weeks, so it just it matters on the baby. Um, again, we have to be realistic with you going back to work and all those things. Um, so you want to really prepare for that and have that information ahead of time. Learning how to integrate baby into your life, you know. So we see people that do the thing where they leave their kids home or their, you know, as much as you can. And I know we're doing things slightly different right now because of COVID. But the more that you can bring your children along, because then they get to have adult friends and they really get to learn how the world works and it makes your life easier. If they're a part of you and they come with you to the grocery store or to the restaurant or, you know, to, I remember going back to school after my daughter was born. I didn't do this with my boys, but I did it with my daughter and I just put her on the breast and wrote notes <laughs> and prayed that she didn't cry during class. <laughs> But it's like I just took her along with my everyday life. So the more you can do that, the better. It will make you integrate back into the world really simply. Okay, and so postpartum plans. And there was a physical plan yes, that was developed. One, if anybody would like one. So you guys all know what a birth plan is, the idea of what a birth plan is, yes? Okay, you, with the idea is that you write down all the things you want, how you want things to go, knowing that it might not exactly go that way, but that's your goal. We want you to do that kind of in your postpartum as well. The more you can figure that out ahead of time and get that written out, and, and if somebody has a question, if they have issues, you can say, well, here's my, here's my plan. This is what I want to do. This is what I want it to look like. It's, it's your body, your baby. You get to do it the way you want to as much as possible. So, for example, um, let's say you want to nurse your baby immediately after birth, but your baby's kind of had sticky lungs a little bit, and so they took the baby to the table, and they cleaned the baby out, and they hung out with the baby for 20, 30 minutes before you got to hold baby. Okay, that's not what your plan was, but so we have to be flexible, but that was for the baby's good. So you'll have to do something similar in postpartum and know that, that sometimes, you know, things don't go exactly to plan, but this will give you some guidelines and ways to make some good decisions. Set boundaries with friends and family. I'm going to repeat that over and over again. It's so important. When I had my third child, I didn't, it's the only child I didn't call my mother when I was in labor. I had to set the boundary, no, you don't get to come to my birth. I'm sorry, I don't want you there. I could feel my mother wringing her hands over the phone lines. And I called her when my youngest was about four or five hours old. She was so mad at me. And I just said, hey, I love you, Mom, but you know what? This baby was more important than your feelings. I was really direct with her, you know. And so, I mean, it's like learn to put you and your baby first and set those boundaries because I've seen breastfeeding relationships unsuccessful because of a parent, a grandparent, or a family member 
that is creating issues. And it's creating so much stress that, uh, in fact, my mother was not successful. My, I mean, I was born in the 50s, but my mom tried to breastfeed me. She had a really supportive OB about nursing, even though they had very weird, archaic ideas of what that meant. And my father would literally lean over and stare when she was trying to nurse me and say things like, oh, that's disgusting. Why are you doing that? And my mother made it to six weeks and then put me on a bottle. That used to happen a lot. Now it happens for kind of different reasons, but it can ha those things can really make a difference. You can find yourself wiped out because you're too busy taking care of an in-law, um, you know, because they want to hold the baby or they want to hang out with you or they want to hold the baby while you make them lunch. Like that's a big no-no, right? Like they come there, you have to remind them if needed, you know, that, they, that they're there to take care of you, not for you to take care of them. Um, and if they don't listen, then you can ask them to leave. And I, I will tell you that 90% of the time those relationships get fixed. Feelings get hurt and, it's, and the more gentle you can be, or if you can get a third party to do it, that's even better. You know? <laughs> because then they can hate them and not you. Right? Um, and plan with your partner ahead of time. You know, sit down with your partner and decide, like, what do you want this to look like? What do you want, you know, what do you want your baby moon to look like? Think about this as being a honeymoon with your baby. You know, we have this pressure to get back into the world and get back to real life as quickly as possible. But you want to have this special time where you be, where you're bonding with your baby and you get to be connected and your body gets to heal and you get to know this little person. And as somebody who had three children, I can tell you they're all different. They come into the world with different energies, different personalities, different behaviors, you know, different different, you know, nursing styles, all of those things. I was a nursing, I am a breastfeeding uh, educator, not nearly as trained as Jana, but I have a little bit of that. And when my second child was born, he would refuse the breast, and I didn't think that was possible. And I remember going and helping this woman get, nurse her baby who she had spent five days with the baby on a bottle and decided at day five that she wanted to nurse her baby. And I thought, there's no way this is going to be successful. I spent 30 seconds working with her baby on the breast. I got in my car and screamed at the top of my lungs, this is not fair. <laughs> and you know, he, this was his, he's like that in, in life. He's direct and strong-willed and stubborn, you know, and my first two were just like, you know, happy to hang out at the breast until, you know, they could you know, until they were older. So you'll find that there's different personalities also. So the more time you take just being in that loving, connected relationship, there's a reason why couples have honeymoons. And so this is just an extension of that with you, your partner, as long as your partner can be home, and the baby. Um, okay, so last thing, oh, one of the last things. So I want to talk about really quickly is postpartum depression. Um, so this is a very long conversation. I'm barely touching, but I'm just touching. So there's normal baby blues. And it's not unusual the day your milk comes in, the day that you're crying. For, for some women, they feel really depressed. They feel low-leveled energy. They just, they're weepy. You know, that's all really normal. If that doesn't go away, it's a red flag and you want to contact somebody and get help. You want to reach out to either your OB, your midwife, your friend, Jana, you know, me. Any of us will direct you. There's lots of people who work with postpartum depression. And then there's actually postpartum depression, which is more of a, you know, consistent state. Um, sometimes counseling, most of the time counseling will work through it. It could be hormonally triggered. Often it is hormonally triggered. Um, and with a little help, we can get you back into balance. And then there's postpartum psychosis. And that's really serious, the crazy stories you hear of a woman that goes off the deep end with her kids and does something terrible. That's postpartum psychosis. And we know it's hormonal. And it's not really recognized and not protected and nourished in this culture the way that it should be. So what I want to say about postpartum psychosis is it usually shows up six months or later, and it's usually the partners that will notice it. She stops eating, she stops communicating, 
She goes, goes into her cave like in a really deep way. She's not connected to her baby. You know, maybe she's drinking and she's kind of drinking on the sideline. You know, if you see signs that things are really bad, you as a partner, and you can tell this to your partners, that, you know, they should call and get help. You know, and if you don't know where else to call, you can always call Women's Health Institute because they can direct you, you know, or first steps, they can direct you to a place where you where they, there can be help. This is a website, it's um, postpartum.net, it's pretty simple, you know, that it actually has a postpartum plan where they can help you kind of regulate that, so that's another resource. Um, yeah, so if you see, if you're, and if you're feeling, Disconnected from the baby, disconnected from the world, sad all the time, your appetite is gone, you, or you're feeling angry a lot, and bristly, and those kinds of things, get help. Because it will continue to get worse. And there's a lot of really good resources out there to help with postpartum depression. And it's not always medication. In fact, often that's like the last thing that they bring in, is they really try to get you support and counseling to really make a difference. And some of that comes from the isolation that we have as women with those babies, especially for a stay-at-home mom. You know, we can feel, and this COVID time has made it even worse. So I'm going to encourage you to reach out for help. Talk to Jana. Talk to Women's Health Institute. You know, call First Steps. If you don't have a First Step worker, um, I encourage you to get one, even if you're on um, baby number three and you think, oh my God, I know, I know what I'm doing. It's always so great. They, they, will, uh, they will come as you know, much as sort of needed, and, and I think they do a lot of it on Zoom now, but, but they also will, if you only want to be seen every two to three months, they'll do it that way. But knowing that you have a backup plan and you have a person that you can get on the phone with and say, something isn't right, and I need help. So having a blue day is normal. Having a few blue days here and there, not great, but also not terribly unusual. Being blue all the time is not normal, and you really want to get help and support. And if you can't figure out how else to do it, go to this website, because they have lots of suggestions on there. OK, so I just want to talk about uh, post, you know, that whole thing about being overtouched. Sometimes we need. Sometimes we need the opposite direction because our bodies are feeling funky. So this is just some, some suggestions. So cranial sacral work, I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but that's one of them. Muscle energy work, um, deep tissue for some people, Reiki energy work, um, reflexology, which sometimes you can do with yourself. And I'll just tell you a real quick one that, way that you can do for yourself is you get yourself a tennis ball and you put it on the floor and you put it on, put, you step on it and roll it on the ball of your foot and then the arch and then the heel and it gets all the points on the bottom of your feet so it can help in pregnancy and it can also help in postpartum by going to a reflexologist as well. Structural integration, also known as rolfing. Any kind of body work like this. Mother roasting, which is using moxa to heat the body, to help it to heal, and chiropractic, because your body's been a little whacked out, you know? So, you know, cranial work works really good on the nervous system, and if your nervous system is really struggling, then that's a really good option. And yes, I'm a cranial psychotherapist, but there's other people in town that do it as well. Okay, so how, things that friends can help. Gentle massage, this is something partners can do. Foot massage, you know, things like that. Um, food train, getting your friends, together. And I will tell you that that can kind of backfire a little bit. Sometimes you end up with too much food in your house. So make sure that, you know, you tell people, wait, wait, no, I still have so much food in my refrigerator. You know, you kind of dictate when the meal comes and not, not let them dictate that. They can leave it on your front door. They don't have to come into the house. You know, they can just leave it there for you. If you can find a new mom support group, which is really we're really lacking and we're trying sort of working. This is part of what we're doing is in these creations. And having a friend who's got a listening ear, somebody that you can cry on their shoulder, that you can talk about how hard it is to be a mom and not feel guilty, not feel like you're a bad mom because you're saying how hard this is. 
You know, this is a big transition in, in a woman's life. And I don't care if it's your first baby or your fifth baby. They go through some form of this one way or another. And no matter how excited you are, how much you love them, how thrilled you are to be a mom, it still can be have its moments. So having somebody that you know, whether it's a therapist or a girlfriend, if you have that kind of relationship with your mom, that you can cry on their shoulder and just talk about how you're feeling. Because sometimes getting all that out, when you're done, you feel like, okay, I can do it. I can go forward. You know, you're ready to, to move on to the next. This was fun. I hope we get to do this again.